So, welcome to the Debian Science Buff. Uh, I admit it's better if you've seen my talk before because I, I laid out some problems and I do not want to repeat these problems here, but I just want to show you something what's about the Debian Science Team statistics and then I would like to discuss some problems which exist to my perception. So, who is the Debian Science Team? I made these um, uh, graphs every year. I'm just updating, and we see some some people who are somehow leaving the team because you have some some missing things here. So Adam C. Powell is so, somehow leaving the team, and Christoph Prutom is also leaving, but others will coming. So the Debian Science Team has some quite active people and somehow, uh, somehow we, people who are not showing off up anymore and the team statistic just helps us to detect the, the people who are leaving us. This is about the discussion. This is a little bit uh, different, but you see it's uh, common names which are, this, I'm, obviously I'm chatting too much, right? I'm just chatting in Debian Science. I do not do so much because it's, I'm working more on the Debian Mate team. But um, if there is something to discuss there, there is a Damian Science ma mailing list. And they have also a developer's mailing list, which is more related to the package. The, the science list is more for general discussion, and this is about the packages. Um, people like Lucas Nussbaum and Matthias Klose are not members of the science team. They are just uh, reminding us, us about bugs. Nice that you are here, Matthias. I guess you will tell something. Um, we have some bug hunters. It's, uh, the um, information is drawn from the UDD. This is about the people who are fixing bugs in Debian science packages. It would be nice if we have, would have some more of them. You've seen this. Adam C. Powell is, is leaving the team somehow. And he has filed a lot of bugs, maybe to his own packages, and has closed them. And we have the committers to the uh, version control system, which is also showing that we, we have uh, quite a large team. If the, um, the person who has uh, 10 least commits has more than 1,000 commits, so you can assume we have 50 or more people who are working in the Debian science team because we have a lot of packages, about 1,000 packages. And um, yeah. My definition of a team is that uh, you wake up in the morning and realize that somebody else has done, uh, has solved your problem from yesterday. This is my experience from the Debian Mate team. I'm really happy that I'm in the team and I have thrown problems into the mailing list and really after waking up, this were solved. I wish it would be the case in the Debian Science team as well, but my theory why it doesn't work that good is that um, in Debian Science is uh, quite a diversity of topics. In Debian Mate, we are closer with the topics. And so my uh, um, proposal in, the, in my, my talk was to care for, well, uh, closer uh, um, topics inside the blends and split, split off some upstream, uh, up some offsprings from Debian Science to different things like Debian Astro or so. And this is uh, quite, um, for me, this graph is the most important one if I want to evaluate a team, because you see here, we have um, a lot of people, or this, this number of packages are touched only by one person. So the majority of package, packages is done by one person. That means, um, well, we have a a common team mailing list, we have a common repository, but we have a single maintainer relationship to the packages, which we really want to avoid. So only a few packages are maintained by two people, and this is, is quite a bad relation. And I, in, in my talk, in my other talk, I've shown you for the Debian Perl team, they have very few packages on, maintained by somebody else, and then it goes up and you have per package three to four committers. And this is the state I really want to reach for Debian Science. But to repeat what I said before, I think we can only reach if we focus on more 
on, on, on smaller topics inside science and create more blends out of, out of it. Well, th um, for some history, we had this competing packaging teams. It is now fully merged. This PKG Skycomp didn't exist anymore. And the maintainers are cont contributing to demand science. And I have the usual above ends with a link to the wiki page. The, the copy doesn't work now. It work. Ah, it works. With, with this string? So we can do some notes. It would be great if, if uh, somebody would do notes about this, if we have some, some ideas how we could work uh, together even better. I have uh, set up this wiki page, oops, it's always the same, for every DebConf, what task we should work on. This is the result of some previous uh, Gobi discussions or some Gobi protocols, and I took over into the wiki. Yeah. What do you want to do now? Any suggestions? Anybody wants to uh, make a suggestion? What's the most urgent problem? What could be done even better? Uh, if not, I spoil in more questions, but I hope are all in this room familiar with Debian Science? I see new faces here. What about you? I, I can't, I don't know. Okay. Anybody else? Do we have general questions? Uh, yes, we should. Well, can, can we can we go, take your mic? So. Uh, I doesn't know uh, Debian Science before. Uh, it is a Linux distribution. No. Okay. No. Okay. This is uh, well funny that um, in my talk before, which you have not seen, I have one slide, and this slide says Debian Science is integrated into uh, uh, into Debian. It's no fork. And usually after my talks, I will ask, why are you doing a different distribution? And now it comes a little bit delayed, two, uh, three hours later. So funny, funny. Enough. No, it's just a team inside Debian, team of scientists or packagers of scientific software, which is somehow organized in a mailing list in um, using some common repository and trying to integrate scientific software as best as possible inside Debian. This is Debian Science with two sentences. And you can contribute if you are a scientist. I am not a scientist, but I will try to Good. That's good. Any other questions? Who's a scientist in here? Hands up. Well, actually, what I consider one of an urgent problem is um, scientists rely on some publications on certain versions of programs, which we can't guarantee with our packaging system because we update packages and then it's a new version or a version which was not used for the publication. What is your take on this in your experience? Well, we have snapshots. Yes, we have snapshots, but uh, one user is, is using the current version from stable, and one other needs the snapshots. Uh, the Docker images. That's Docker an images. Ob obvious solution. Yeah, yeah. Actually, there's a, there's a um, science-based um, container thing. What's the name again? Singularity, right? Mm. Please, always to the mic, because we are on video recording. People inside will understand you, but not outside. Most clusters, uh, I don't think there are any known clusters that use Docker, on, mm. on, because it requires running a root on daemon and giving mm. uh, users access to that. Mm. So 
if Docker or some other um, container technique is the answer to the question, what can we do to help users to easily create this kind of containers? Do you think it should make some sense to craft some scripts which draws the correct versions from snapshots and create a Docker image at request? Or is it, should users just do it manually? So the singularity, when you make a Debian container, you can you put the, the mirror URL. Mm -hmm. And so instead of just putting you know, your FTP um, mm -hmm. or your HTTP reader.debian.org, you just put snapshot.debian.org and then the date, and it will build your container with whatever was in Debian at that date. And that will be your mirror from where you retrieve mm -hmm. all your packages. So just to explain it to me, which I might a little bit uh, uh, slow with, with thinking. So a user comes and says to me, I need BWA version 2.1 and create a Docker image for me. And what do I need to do to provide the user with this version? Well, user can do it himself. Yeah, I don't know. But, but I, would, I would like to support this user. What, what the user needs to do or what? Uh, well, so. So first, to make clear, we're not talking about Docker, just because Docker is not um, used on HPC systems. But mm -hmm. so for Singularity, um, I think it's easier if you come from the point of view as I'm starting a project today, and I want to use, I want to um, keep whatever I'm using today for the entire duration of the project. Mm -hmm. And so for that situation, snapshots is easy to, to implement. But then if you're looking for a specific version, you would have to find um, you would have to find out when that version was present in the repositories. Yeah, this, you know? this is what, what I mean. The user can do it itself, but the user need to know snapshots. He need to know how to create a Docker image. He need to know whatever. And I would, to like, would like to make it not brain dead easy, but at least easy to say, please call a program which the arguments are the name of the package, the version of the package, and press enter, and then the Docker image will be created for you. This is something, this is, I'm, I'm not using Docker or, or any other container techniques, but this is something you think it's feasible to do and it's sensible to do. Yeah, I, I don't know. <laughs> any other opinions about this container techniques? Are you involved with singularity packaging? Sorry? Are you involved with singularity packaging or something? I wonder if I covered it on the thing, to be honest, but okay. Um, so can you hear me? Okay, so there's also Flatpak and Snappy packages, which is kind of useful if you want to drop a specific version of something on a on a machine, but I haven't looked into either yet myself. <laughs> but I've been meaning to because they're very lightweight, they're not as big as a container. Mm. And they have their own mechanisms for updating the package. So uh, um, it's almost like a Debian package in some way, but. Mm. Yeah, there's it talks about that, actually. Mm. But, but the point is that, I mean, that's good for desktop, but it's really not useful probably for uh, HPC cluster. Mm. Yeah, I think, well, the flat pack is, is just another way to create a kind of virtual machine ish, uh, Docker ish, uh, uh, container ish. Things it's I don't care much so much about the technique below, but it is possible to provide the user with an easy way to create create this stuff. Um, I work uh, I work with Flatpak, and um, actually it is relatively easy after you worked around a few well differences in uh, in how to, uh, it's relatively easy to create one of these bundles in order to run your application. For you. For me at the moment, I'm, yeah. I don't think it's it's super simple yet for for like especially for scientists it's super hard because it involves uh, knowing how to how to compile applications and how to make uh, how to like how to how, it requires you to know how to how the system works and how you can uh, how you can create this bundle which is not something uh, scientists would actually like to deal with and want to learn but I think. Um, it's actually in this case a good idea to look in this direction. Um, 
like specifically Flatpak in itself is right at the moment only for desktop applications and it doesn't really handle the case of console applications well. Mm. And most, um, at least most applications I deal with in the scientific field are console apps. Um, I'm thinking about actually making some changes to Flatpak and submitting a few, um, a few pull requests to make console applications work a bit better. Uh, that could help. Um, yeah, in the sense of Snappy, um, creating snaps is actually really easy because you can base um, on existing uh, dev packages, but Snappy has the uh, other problem that it's very tied to Canonical, and it's Canonical store, so I'm not sure how well this would work for Debian in this case at this current time. So uh, I do think long term, those bundling solutions, any one of them would be great for this specific problem. Uh, in the short term, we might need to uh, need to work on them to get them to a point where they are uh, as useful for scientific software as they currently are for desktop applications. Um, yeah, that's yeah. my opinion on this. Well, as I tried to explain, I do not mind about it is called flat, flat pack with its advantages and disadvantages or um, other container techniques. For me, it's, it's important to say, well, we know what scientists will do if they need a, spe a specific version. They download from upstream, compile themselves, uh, put it in their home directory, and they do it wrong. This is, and I, I do want to prevent this, they do it wrong uh, uh, thingy, because uh, I've seen it, and it just doesn't work that way, and I try to make sure we can provide the users with something which is less error prone than the, this process. Would it simple change root, a uh, simple root environment? Work? Yeah, whatever, change root, flat pack, uh, docker, it's all the same. They need some kind of virtualization and put the, but how can we do it easy to, well, you know how to uh, create a change root, I know it, but how can we do, say, well, create me this technique with package X version Y and do it for me and run. Question is what is easy actually? Uh, what, what level of easy are we aiming for? Uh, is it like something like Python's virtual env easy or is uh, it as easy like... Well, usually e easy, my definition of easy is my mother can do it. Okay. <laughs> it's, there are different definitions of easy but yeah, something like this. I, or I, c I can explain my mother on the phone how to do it. This is, this is easy. Well, I think we could craft a script to, to make creating shoots easy for scientific stuff uh, or to create Docker images or to create flat files yeah, or to yeah. create anything. Yeah. But uh, yeah, we would need to investigate which system works best and uh, what the advantages and disadvantages are and then test whether scientists would actually use this stuff. So yeah, lots of exploration to be done, I guess. Mm. What I also saw a lot these days is that upstream, or at least from the ones I package, is that they use Conda packages. Have mm -hmm. you heard about that? Yeah, Conda is also some technique. I'm, I'm not so deep. Maybe if you can explain a little bit, but it's some kind of alternative to, to maintain a parallel packing, packaging system in your home directory. Is this correctly or so? Maybe if you could talk in the, the phone. I'm not an expert on Conda, but I know it's like uh, you can select the prefix and you can install into a into a specific prefix. So you can be your home directory. You can also do it system wide, or you can set up a new environment and have a set of packages installed there. Um, but that's it's it's a new package manager and it's a new packaging format, hmm. and it's supposed to be um, operating system independent. So. Hmm. So, uh, I propose Conda, we, there is some effort to package Conda for, um, by the Debian Med team, but we, we, it's kind of some work because some pre-dependencies, I think Carsten did some research about 50 Python modules to package also, but it's, it's doable in principle. And if, if Conda would be the answer for, for biologists, I, I would try to implement it. Right. Well, no, the point is that the upstreams would have their Conda recipes. It kind of like sidesteps Debian in a sense that... It sidesteps Debian, yes. That, that's, that's right. It's the same with Singularity, I guess. Mm. Like, uh, 
Singularity would be a solution for somebody to like mail mm. a container to a research partner and they can just run mm. the thing the same way that the guy did on their HPC cluster and get reproducible results mm. from the thing. Yeah, I but mean, Singularity is in Debian um, and uh, yeah. I don't think Singularity sidesteps Debian. Actually, it, um, it expands it because you can, if someone has a non-Debian cluster, you, have your, you can actually create a Debian container and take advantage of the Debian packages that are there. So if somebody was running like, uh, like how we do at our site, we have a Red Hat cluster, but people are making Ubuntu containers, they can, have, they can take advantage of the Debian packages. So otherwise, the packages we make for Debian only get installed on Debian systems where people have root access. But here you can use them elsewhere. And, and the nice thing with Singularity is um, you make your definition file, you just install the packages you want. You have a uh, environment set up that, is, that you, you preserve just for your project. And um, so that's, that's one, one interesting thing about Singularity is so I actually listened to a talk by I don't remember the name. It was at the um, German Music Group meeting in Darmstadt, and he's a, he, he was an all-time X11 developer, and he's now working for the HPC division at Zuse, and he's he uh, packaged Singularity, and he said that he had a lot of trouble with the Zuse um, security team because it's a set user ID, and so they don't allow it. But so that's an interesting point that uh, in Debian it just got through FTP master, and everybody's fine with it. But the uh, Zoo said, no, no, that's a huge attack surface. We, we, we don't allow it, it's just as a command. Also, there is nothing comparable to FTP master for Zuse, so you can just upload or? Sorry again? There is no FTP master thingy for Zuse, so you can upload and? No, it, it, the Zuse security team um, blacklists or like refuse to, to uh, let it through because it's set user ID. Ah, okay, okay. Mm. So that's the problem with the mm. same mm. thing as said yeah, you need a docker a root run daemon for docker that you don't need it for singularity but singularity itself is set user id mm, okay mm. well it's the same thing with change width right i mean mm. you need something to actually get in there uh, at least on linux uh you need to be root or mm. some similar thing, um, capability to get into there uh, yes change root can help with that but still Yeah, Singularity is a set user ID, but um, it's only for the mounting and creating images and for, for actually um, to, to create the image uh, file. But to actually bootstrap the image, you need to be root. And so the idea is that you have a workstation where you are root, and you do that, you build your container, then you move the container over, and you don't run it. Um, it doesn't need the escalate privileges. So the, 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 basically, it's the author being careful. With it. As, it's still set UID, but it's um, you don't need to be right. But I think it's only set UID to be able to mount the file system. But it's right. so the basically the developer is being careful about minimizing what gets done with the Escalate privileges. But still, yeah, it's well, maybe Zeus is working on on minimizing it using capabilities or something, and would be useful. What about to? Well, I'm, I don't think that we can uh, continue here, uh, uh, or we should continue on to this tep topic. What about test suites? We we we, I, we just reported about the Debian made effort to put test suite. Is there anybody who would volunteer to to mentor an outreachy Google Summer of Code uh, um, student to run to create test uh, suites for the Debian science packages? This would be also interesting. It's uh, for me. It's fun to uh, mentor somebody who, who is doing this. I mean, it's it's a little bit generic with the Debian uh, science. So you maybe you need well, to. What, what do you mean with test suite? Well, um, as uh, Natya is, is writing auto PKJ tests for all the Debian made packages, or she will manage, sorted by Popcon. So we we get the most used packages equipped with a with the auto PKG test and I think it would is, is really valuable and we should have it for, for other sciences okay, as well. Okay, but what is the scope? Is the scope that 
the program, or maybe you just talk later um, about it, but is it the scope that the program just runs correctly, or are you actually... Yeah, at least. That is a minimum requirement, yes, sure. Okay, and if there's an upstream test suite, you integrate that? Yes. If there's but if there's not? Yeah. Well, well, the thing is, you need, you if need there's an upstream domain test suite, we, if there's an upstream test suite, we use it as an uh, auto BKG test. If there is no upstream test suite, Nadja has written one. Wow. Okay. I'm actually so I started doing it for other packages that I maintain, but it's it's actually one of the to dos I forgot for Debicam is uh, doing auto package tests. Yeah. yeah. We should. I mean, we run all the test suite during package build. Yeah. But it's certainly. Um, I think very useful for researchers to know that actually the packages as they are installed are yeah. working correctly and that's I'm I'm a believer or converted now and I just didn't have the time to do it for that. Yeah sure you don't have the time the same for us and so try to uh, involve interns because it is for an intern it's an optimal task because um, you work down a list of packages and you can, if your internship ends, you just stop with it and then it's, it's, it's some amount of work, it's done. This is a, quite a good task, uh, very fit for this job. And um, what I wanted to say? Yeah, well, uh, in, in Debian Med, we are doing the, the auto PKG test that way that we also provide um, a script in user uh, share doc package name. Uh, run tests or so, something like this, and uh, put also a readme.test how the user who installed the package can run the suite as well. So then they have an, as an example how to run the program. Um, I just got an idea about how this idea of running auto package tests would play in with the problem of pinning versions. So um, just a couple of days ago, I had a problem where uh, a test suit would break because BWA got updated to a newer version, right? Mm -hmm. Because the upstream author of the package that broke the tests uh, decided to include uh, reference data for uh, his own program's output mm -hmm. in, into mm -hmm. the, the test, right? So um, couldn't that be a, a, an approach to think about to uh, write auto package tests that do this, check for changes in um, the output and then give upstream some kind of indication when something's going to break so they mm -hmm. can adjust their own code for... Um, so you, may, you mean uh, include uh, if, if fails and mail x so Well, it doesn't blah. need to be automated. It, uh -huh. Just you need to know when uh, an upgrade in a, de in a dependency, for example, mm -hmm. yeah. um, would, would break the results or change the results of, of a scientific package. Yeah, sure, there's a sense of tests to, to yeah. notice when the... So, I mean, if, if that would be a viable option to, to just let upstream know and work with them, they maybe even provide some kind of, of, of uh, patch. Usually if a test suite uh, uh, breaks and you get a bug report and you forward the bug and uh, to, to upstream, so... I'm not sure if I understand the problem correctly. Yeah, I mean, my, my idea would be um, make sure that auto package tests test if the results change and if the results change ah, because the okay. auto package tests also get run mm. uh, if a dependency is updated. Yeah, okay. So then, mm. then you can find out mm. what dependency broke the results or changed the results. Can you please uh, take that? Mm. We, we have m several mics so please yeah. so, so speak to the mic. To, to make sure the test yes, here's another one. if the results change. So it's not about making sure that the program runs. It also needs to do the same thing that the previous version did, or that, that the same version did with a different dependency. Well, isn't that just making sure that test is run again when the dependencies change? Well, I was, I was under the impression that that ha would happen anyway. So if the, if no, a I it mean, if, if a package is not changed in Debian and just its dependencies change, then in general it's not okay. run. Right. Then so disregard anything I just said. <laughs> no, no, but I mean, this is, this is a good point, that uh, if the dependencies change, then the, at least the Debian auto builders will not rebuild automatically reverse dependencies of, uh, after an upload. Sure. Well that Unless, of course, it's a library and the library name changed. Then sure, the but that's why I built these. I was talking about auto package tests and DEPCI. Uh, and I'm not sure whether DEPCI does that. Is it doing it? Does, does anyone know? Yeah, just just a crazy idea thrown in. Mm -hmm. so, um. mm -hmm. yeah. 
Uh, hi, uh, I just have a, a comment about these auto tests. Uh, uh, when they fail, does that mean that the package fails to build? Well, at least the tested part is fails. So maybe the package do, works for 95%, but these five percent that are tests fail. Yes. That you can't say, but it's it's a bug anyway. Yeah. So sometimes sometimes these bug pop, bugs pop up in in the test suites themselves. For example, in the GNU scientific library, mm -hmm. uh, when there was a transition from uh, GCC six to seven, the test just uh, failed because the optimi optimizer changed and uh, mm -hmm. the some of the tests end, fa end up failing on some architectures. And so, so you end up with case of fake, flaky tests instead. Yes, of just, uh, it's it's possibly uh, it's, it's uh, quite a common thing that not the program is broken, but the test is broken. So yeah, but then uh, the fa test has to be fixed, and which means the package is buggy because the test is wrong. Well, or the GCC is buggy. Or the GCC is buggy. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> no, but I think there's several layers. I mean, either. So, for example, uh, in Debicam, we do have the tendency of running the test suite, but not failing the package build if there's failures, depending on the package. Because there are some packages where there is failures. Um, so you, you, it depends on how the, pa how the packaging is done, whether you half fail on the fail test. And then all the package test is, as far as I understand, independent of that. But you would run the same test suite during package build, and then you would run, well, you can run them, and then you run it again after the package build via the package test. Well. Uh, just a small comment for GSL. Uh, in that case, it was all the tests passing for a number of months, and everything was perfect, and then GCC update and GSL is failing and not building anymore. <laughs> yeah, well, the, this is the sense of the test to, to know that things are failing how because... You, how did you uh, realize it? I mean, did you upload GSL or somebody did uploaded GSL and then it did fail to build or was DebCI telling you, oh, GCC got updated and now it's not working anymore? And then DebCI automatically rebuilt GSL or... Uh, I think it was OBS. Ah, it was OBS, okay, OBS. System. Yeah. Well, this that's why we. I'm so keen on having test suites on all the packages to know when this fails, right? Because if if you don't run the test suite because there is no test, you assume everything is okay and it's it's not no no matter what package is responsible. But we need to have the whole package pool uh, keeping sync. Yeah, we have the problem that it's really difficult sometimes to to get all the tests run okay on all architectures. And um, I guess it would be really, really a lot of work to, to, to get everything green. And then being at that point saying, okay, now we, we'll, we'll check whenever it fails, we get a bug report or we see it, it's failing. But um, I had packages which failed the test tube because I was running them on one thread or one core only, and they would, uh, they didn't even think about somebody only running it on one core because they only run it on 1,000 cores in parallel, right? So, um, and then, well, what, what I'm saying is that, that okay, well, then maybe we disable that test or something, but it's always a lot of manual work to get the, the whole test suit green. Mm -hmm. If it's <coughs> if it's thousands of tests, and it's it's a miracle of flakiness. But yeah, it's certainly the the thing that it should be. But maybe it's more easy for some packages than for others. Yeah. What is, as, as I said, in the end, somebody has to write the test in the first place. And then, yeah. So how, how much time we is? We have 10 minutes left. 10 minutes, yeah. Maybe I can continue a bit in, in this uh, duplicate names issue because um, Upstream has a tendency to use quite generic names, which are in conflict with other packages. And I implemented for the Debian mid um, plan, well, it's for implemented for all, but not, not realized in other things, that we put 
the copy with the original name under user lib blends, in this case made, bin. And if the user sets this in his path, then he can use the generic name because some scripts are relying on it. It's maybe, maybe it's a little bit hackish, but it, it works like this because in, in, in user bean we have a non-conflicting -conf name with, um, it's not that generic, but users really want, want to have this. So what do you think about this solution? Is that a proposal or is it? No, it's working? implemented. You can use it. It's in the p-link package, for, in, for instance. p-link is a, uh, it's connected to putty, and it existed, and p-link is also a biological program. And, uh, we have it in, in here, in the, with, with made p-link, and in user bin, it's some other name. And if the user puts this, or this, this is put in the path, and in, if the user sets a variable in his environment, then, this pass will be prepended for the system pass, and he needs to know that the, the original peeling will not work. But this is, is a user decision. But that wouldn't protect you against uh, name duplications within the same blend, would it? Well, y yes. Well, yeah. If if you have a um, name clash inside one blend, then it doesn't help. But yeah, we have this problem anyway. So yeah. It's uh, just to make sure that all packages are um, co-installable. So we had the, the situation at first that, that uh, PuTTY and PLink couldn't be installed together. PuTTY was first, and so it wins. And so it's uh, per policy not OK to make a conflict between these packages because they, they do not really conflict. And so we found a solution. So this solution enables users to keep the old known name, to run their old known scripts. It, it's but, but I don't get it. So they would run p-link. Well, users who set. Um, what would the user have to do? I mean. The user needs to do. Wait, I think I have an example here. No. The user puts a file home.blends and says, I'm a member of the Debian Meet team. That's what the user has to do. And it should do because we, 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 we couldn't, uh, could not write into any home directories. And this had the effect that in um, etc profile.d, where is this blend? Didn't I? In Debian Meet SR. So there is a Debian Meet SR installed by the Meet Common Package. And so if in home of the user is a dot blends, then it will be passed for, for the, uh, the blend string. And you get the blend pass. And the blend man pass, and this is prepended before your user for the normal pass. So that particular user would then prefer peeling to yes. peeling and not putty. Yes. No other users is um, affected, but this user who actively sets. Well, this is maybe this is the solution I came up with. Maybe you know better solutions, well, it, but it sounds okay. It's just also yeah. very not, not very discoverable. Yeah. I didn't know about it. Mm. Yeah, I, I think nobody really knows about it, but I put it in. There should be some user documentation for blends. So I don't know exactly yeah. how we should do that, but. Yeah, I would love if somebody would <laughs> document this. <laughs> so, any other things? Yeah, DebTex is also a running effort, which is. Yeah, we, we, we should find a better design for depth text. I started with this for Debian Meet, but, and I stopped at some point in time and, yeah, didn't continue it. These are basically the problems I have seen in the wiki. Any other problems? If not, we might stop here.
sorry, yeah. and that's that stop. Thanks for attending.